Great. Well, thank you, Vicky. Um, thank you to everyone here for being here right at the end. Um, as Vicky says, I'm going to kind of wrap up the day a little bit today. We've heard lots of great talks about um, new technology. We've seen some of the demonstrations out um, in the hall earlier. But what I want to do is bring us back a little bit to the human side of this. So um, Jess talked a bit in a presentation earlier about kind of bringing the human into technology with healthcare. I'm going to talk a bit more broadly. So when we're looking at the new reality, how is that impacting the relationship between human behavior and technology? And how is the relationship between human behavior and technology, how might that shape the new reality? Now, it might seem surprising, but I'm going to start my talk about the relationship between human behavior and technology with a video about cats and cucumbers. Bear with me. If it plays. Uh, there we go. Okay, a bit of laughing in the room. Um, this video has been watched over a million times. It's just one of many videos on YouTube of cats being scared by cucumber. In total, tens of millions of people have been watching these videos over the last few months, maybe a year or so. Um, I think it's just it's clear that a lot of people find this funny. You know, we find it funny that a cat is jumping at a cucumber. Okay? There are some people who think it's cruel that we find it funny, but I think we can clear that a lot of people do find it funny. And, you know, it's obvious why we do it. It's a bit silly, isn't it? You know, why is a, why is a cat scared of an inanimate object like a cucumber? It's, it's funny, you know. If people who think cats are uh, cleverer than dogs, perhaps this is the argument against. But is it really that surprising? Is it really that silly? The cat clearly thinks the cucumber is a snake. And, you know, when snakes can get as kind of big and ugly as this one about the show, you know, it's probably understandable why you get scared. <laughs> but needless to say, that's the reaction I was hoping for. Um, I haven't played this video or these two videos just to make sure you're awake at the end of the day, although obviously that is one of the benefits. But um, I think there are two important points that these videos show, and this relates to what I'm going to talk about with the relationship between humans and technologies. First of all, it's completely natural and understandable to be scared. Okay? It's a human instinct that's been developed over uh, you know, thousands, if not millions of years. You know? We have this human need to protect ourselves, so it's quite obvious we're going to get scared. Just as the cat gets scared, we get scared as well. It's a human need. We can't fight that. We can't override that. Second, you knew this was a TV screen or projector screen, but still you flinched. You know, even if you didn't jump, you might have felt your heart flutter a little bit, a bit of adrenaline through your body. Why is that? You knew it was a, you knew it was a screen. You know that wasn't actually a snake. Well, the reason is your brain had to make a quick decision, okay? That snake jumped out in a split second, and your brain quickly had to say, you know, is this a threat or not? Um, and that is, so, that is like so many decisions we have to make, particularly in the world we're living in at the moment. You make so many quick decisions when there's abundance of information, and your brain has to make a decision based on that limit, limited information that you have. So really, what I'm going to talk about today is it's all about being human. Our understanding of technology needs to start with our understanding of human behavior and you know that's where behavioral science really comes from so for people who don't know much about behavioral science or behavioral economics as it's called it really is kind of the intersection of economics with psychology sociology neuroscience things like that it's all about um, you know, a practical application of our understanding of human behavior so how do we create products policies communications based on who we really how we really think and behave rather than how we think people should think and behave. And when I was um, told about the topic of this, 
this, you know, event today and saw who, some of the people he was speaking. It really did make me think of a quote by one of the most famous behavioural scientists there is, a guy called uh, Amos Tversky. He's actually one of the fathers of behavioural science, really. Him and uh, Daniel Kahneman conducted many of the experiments in the 60s, 70s and 80s of which much behavioural science is based on. Whenever he was asked about you know, artificial intelligence, this is what he used to say. My colleagues, they study artificial intelligence. Me, I study natural stupidity. And sometimes when you're looking at human behaviour and behavioural science, it's, it's easy to think that. You know, there are lots of situations where people act in ways that seem surprising or, or you know, seem irrational. You know, people acting just in surprising ways. Um, and one of the big questions is, you know, is technology making us act in more surprising and more rational ways? You know, is technology making us, making us stupid? I think lots of us can look at this picture and go, okay, well, why can't we be like the, the woman in the middle who's enjoying the moment? All these other people are on their phones, you know, taking pictures and things like that. Why can't we be like the person enjoying the moment? Well, what I would say is that I think sometimes, undoubtedly, technology changes our behaviour. But I think sometimes we can overplay how much impact it really changes on our fundamental, who we are as human beings. Because one generation might look at this photo and think it's silly, but then another generation might have looked at this photo and thought it was silly. Is there much difference between, you know, the need, is there much difference between getting a photo, an autograph and spending time doing that than taking a picture at the event? It's both related to this need to show people you were there, to record that fact, you know, to show it off. Is it that different to when people used to get souvenirs or, you know, sending postcards from your holiday? It's all about this still fundamental human need of trying to show off to people and trying to record that you were there. And that's why I think, you know, I used the quote previously, but I think actually a quote that is often more relevant when we're looking at technology and the relationship with human behaviour is one by Bill Birnbach. You may have heard of him, one of the legends of uh, advertising. Um, he had a, from the US, he had a quote which says this. It took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. It will take millions more for them to even vary. It is fashionable to talk about changing man. A communicator must be concerned with unchanging man with his obsessive drive to, drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his home. Now, one point I'll point out is that this is a quote from the, the 60s, I think it is, so I think we might change that from changing man to changing person. Um, but I think you know, the, the principle of that is very clear, um, that you know, we do focus sometimes too much on what we think is changing, but not enough on actually what is unchanging. And I think this is very important if we want to understand technology and what works. So, for example, um, let's look at healthcare apps. Um, I, found, I found a source that says that there are 165,000 health apps on the Apple Store alone. Now, a vast majority of these are hardly downloaded. If they are downloaded, they're hardly ever used. But these are, a lot of them, probably great apps. You know, they're things that are trying to help you, you know, diagnose illnesses or get you fit, etc. But I think, as we all know, one of the most successful kind of apps for having an impact on health behaviour in recent years, Pokemon Go. You know, Pokemon Go has been seen, at least in the short term, to have an impact on people's exercise, increased exercise, particularly amongst people who would normally not be impacted by technology and healthcare apps and things. And what's interesting about this is, look at the human need behind here. The reason why Pokemon Go is popular because it taps into the human need for fun, for competition, for reward that you get, also for social interaction, you know, it's often a social experience. The, the health benefit was an additional one to that. It wasn't the driving force of it. And I think if we want to understand technology and what could be successful, try to understand that human need first. Ex an example, just to wrap up this part of the presentation, is one uh, that we're looking at as a team at the moment. So looking at an old technology here, um, a lot of work we do is around employee well-being. So can you employ a apply behavioural science to help people, um, you know, be, look after themselves better at work, take more exercise, eat more healthily, etc. One of the things we've been looking at is how can you encourage people to use the stairs rather than the lift? A lift is a, a technology that changed our behaviour in the past. It's actually very difficult to change the behaviour again. Now, there is reasons why you use the lift rather than use the stairs. You know, it's just easier, you can be a bit lazy and things. But from our research, it suggests there's another reason as well. One of the reasons why people use the lift, and you might not realise this, but one of the reasons why you use the lift is you like to look at yourself in the mirror. 
So whether you're going up to the office in the morning or you're going to a meeting, you have a valuable few seconds where you can check out, check your hair, is your shirt tucked in, things like that. It taps into that need that you have. So one of the things that we are trialing is, can you put mirrors in stairwells? Can you change the behavior by actually addressing that fundamental need trying to do, rather than trying to do something else? Okay, so I've talked about the importance of understanding you know, human needs and how that can give you a sense of what, te what technology might take off and what technology might not. But I think still as behavioral scientists, you see that people often act in ways that you think might be contrary to their needs. And that's really what you're trying to understand sometimes is why are people doing that, how can we help? And I actually think Tversky's quote about natural stupidity, I don't think he really meant that. You know, we, we don't think that people are stupid. But what we do think is that often people are constrained. So you're making decisions that are quick with loads of information. You haven't, you know, you're not, we're not supercomputers. I heard the talk about Watson and IBM this morning. You know, that the amount of calculations that Watson could do every year just, you know, increases year on year. The human brain is not like that. We are constrained. Our ability to make decisions is constrained. And I think this has a real impact for where technology can help us, what I'll come on to. But just to explain that a little bit more. So when I say constrained, it's estimated that our brains are bombarded by about 11 million bits of information per second. But our conscious brain can only process about 40 bits of information per second. So it's a tiny proportion. All this information that's coming in through your, all your senses, your eyes, your ears, your nose, sense of touch, etc. only a tiny proportion can your conscious brain process. So what does your brain do? Well, what it does is it looks for shortcuts. To avoid crashing like a computer, looks for shortcuts, looks for patterns in information so it can make quick decisions. In effect, what it does is it joins the dots. So most people looking at this, you can, you know, you've only got a little bit of information, but you can probably see you know, an image there, an image of a duck. Or is it a duck? Maybe it's a rabbit. For those who can't see a rabbit on, its, on the other axis. And this is what we're really trying to understand often in behavioral sciences. When is your brain joining the docs, making quick decisions, and is it sometimes making the decisions perhaps are not in your own best interest? And can we understand that, and how can we, we help uh, interact with that? Now, what I would suggest, we talk about this new reality. I think one of the big changes at the moment in this new reality in what we're living is an information overload. So we talk about all this information that's coming into our brain at any one moment. I think this is increasing. You know, this, the amount of information that we have available at our fingertips is increasing hugely. But that is not changing our capacity to take in that information, to digest it, to make decisions based on it. That 40 bits of information your conscious brain can process, that's not changing. And the risk is that our brain can't cope with it. We can't cope with it, just as we've struggled to cope with the abundance of sweet, fatty food in the last few decades. You know, we weren't designed to be able to cope with this. What, our, what we tend to do is we tend to hoard, we tend to gorge. And is there a risk that we might do this with information as well? We haven't yet adapted to the new age that we live in. So I'm gonna talk about how two, th two ways I think technology could help with that, this. One is about how it can help us focus maybe. So when we got all this information, can technology help us focus on the most important information at a point when you're making a decision? And then secondly, I'm going to talk about contextual learning. So actually, can technology help us train our brains to actually learn in environments when there's lots of stimulus coming through? But I'll talk about focusing first. And obviously, to talk about this, I'm going to go back to animal behavior. Um, you can tell I'm an animal lover here. Uh, a question, I don't expect you to answer this. A question, how do you get a horse down the stairs? Now, seems like a strange question. It is a strange question, uh, but it's a question that a preacher uh, faced hundreds of years ago. Maybe slightly apocryphal, this story, but it's a story that's commonly told in kind of um, horse circles. Um, <laughs> that uh, a preacher had a wager with someone in his village that he could get a horse up the stairs of his house. Okay, a bet was laid, um, and he won the bet easily. Got the, you know, he was a good horseman, got the horse to the top of his house. But that's when the problems began, because what the preacher couldn't do was get the horse down again. The horse was in a different environment, you know, different stimulus. It was spooked, it was scared. And they just couldn't do anything to actually get the horse to come back down the stairs. So what the preacher did was he hooded the horse. He put, it over, put a hood over the horse so it couldn't see all the stimulus and wasn't scared by it and led it down the stairs. And the story is, this is what led to the invention of blinkers. 
So it's that inspiration that led others to realize that if you want horses to do things, sometimes blinker out um, other distractions on them. Now, what I'm not saying, and definitely not advocating, is that we need to blinker humans. That is not what I'm saying at all. But I think there's an interesting lesson from that, an insight about that, that sometimes when we need to do something, actually what we need to do is cut out distractions. And we need to be able to focus on the information that's important at the time to allow us to do something which is important. Um, and I think technology potentially has a role with that. Um, I'm going to talk some, some of these are more techy than others, but there are examples where providing people with timely feedback in the moment really does make an inf impact on their behavior. This is an example from the NHS. Uh, they ran a project to look at, can we get doctors to stop um, Sent, uh, using unnecessary lab tests or um, un, uh, prescribing unnecessary drugs because, you know, it's costly to the NHS and they're unnecessary. Now, one of the uh, inputs they're supposed to take into the decision-making is the cost of these things, the cost of drugs, the cost of uh, lab tests. But there was a feeling that perhaps the costs weren't actually being considered at the moment of the decision. So it's something really simple. And what they do now with the drugs or with, with the lab test is when you have to order this, the price pops up. Now, they did it with the lab test one. They did an experiment in two hospitals. And just by adding the price information there and then, at that moment, uh, reduced unnecessary lab, um, uh, lab appointments by a third, which if you scale it up is a saving of three million. And that's just from one lab test. And that's a lab test that cost about a pound. So just by providing information, information doctors already have, but providing it in that moment you're making a decision can really help you focus and make a different decision. And then if we take this forward to kind of like newer technology, I think AR has a real role to play here, or potentially has a role to play. So can it, can it by overlaying reality, can we be presented with information that helps us make a, a better decision in a real-time moment? So an example of that is things you'll see about AR being used to put sat-navs into your windscreens. So, you know, sat-navs already give you a bit of real-time information, but can you be given information actually in your windscreen while you're driving? Things that might influence how you drive, so actually showing you your distance to other cars, or maybe flashing up accident hotspots or telling you how many people have had accidents uh, there before. So timely, real information really making you focus. Another example, final example I want to give is around how it could be maybe used, how timely feedback can be used or is being used to try and change uh, social media behavior. This is a campaign, some people may have seen this, it won uh, a can uh, this year. It's a campaign in the US with the, the charity Headspace, a mental health char charity. I've got a video which will explain it. I think it'd be better than me explaining it. It's hard to believe our children are still not protected from cyberbullying. Taunting has moved from schoolyards to social media, but kids don't think about the effect their words really have. Young people don't fully develop their moral compass until adulthood. So, working with Headspace, we created an educational tool to help children when they first become social media active. ReWord, a real-time alert for online bullying behaviour. I see things like, I hate you, or nobody likes you. With ReWord, if you type that, the red line appears and people don't bully as much. ReWord is built with a custom lexicon database that uses multiple strings to create millions of potential insult combinations. As a child types, reject matching cross-references the database to identify abusive patterns. When one is found, the child is alerted with a red strike through, instantly interrupting their behaviour. ReWord uses a red line because it's a simple visual alert that something's wrong. Don't bully and the line will never appear. ReWord is designed to recognise bullying sentiment and context, not just swearing. And to help the tool evolve, children can add new bullying words and phrases, increasing its intelligence. Launching in Australian schools with a Google Chrome extension, ReWord addressed the issue in front of the media, growing global support for the tool. They do need the tools to solve the problem themselves. The new Google Chrome extension called ReWord. With the backing of the Australian government, ReWord will be installed in all Australian schools and expanded to mobile devices, reaching all messaging platforms.
Reword is changing bullying behaviour, creating a new generation that respect each other online and in real life. So for me, that's an example of a technology that's trying to do exactly what we're talking about. So um, in a moment, can it make you focus on, on something that perhaps is in your thought process but tries to bring it to the, to the fore? I mean, as one of the girls said there, it's a simple visual alert that something is wrong. It's not, it's not stopping you from doing something. It's just making a piece of information particularly salient at that moment you're making a decision. It's not without controversy, this, um, this approach. Um, we still need to see like, the long-term impact of it as well. But I think it's where you may start to see technology going with helping us make decisions when there's lots of information, you know, particularly teenagers who are you know, bombarded with information and influences. I think it's a way you'll see technology go. But so those are some examples of um, how technology can give us timely prompts. So in a moment, make us focus on something which will influence our decision. But in, in reality, we're not going to be able to do this all the time. You know, you're not always going to be able to overlay reality with some information. Um, you know, too many contexts, too many challenges with that. So is there anything else, I think, where technology might have an influence? Well, I think what's interesting there is perhaps the influence that virtual reality can have, and particularly about the idea of contextual learning. Um, there's a lot of talk about where, where the VR can change behaviour or not. It was actually one of the questions in the, the, uh, the panel just before lunchtime, wasn't it, about, you know, has it been shown, shown to change behaviour? A lot of talk is around... I thought it was interesting that the first answer to that was actually what, around what charities are doing. And that's because a lot of the focus at the moment is VRs being empathy machines. So, you know, you put in a situation, you empathise with the situation, the person that you're in. Um, from, from what I know and can see, you know, the jury's still out a little bit on that. Not in terms of whether VR can create empathy, but whether that actually creates long-term behaviour change or not. There are a few scientific studies. There's some odd pictures up there. Scientific study looking at uh, trying to get someone to experience being a cow. So using virtual reality on your hands and knees, you're in a, in a field, in a paddock, you know, things like that, and then you're taken off to the slaughterhouse. So do you empathise more with animals? Uh, another one where you're put in the Great Barrier Reef and you can experience the coral dying. So you can, not only do you see it, but you hear it as well. And you can feel vibrations underneath you as the coral dies and cracks. And, you know, evidence that it does increase empathy. What's unclear at the moment, I think, is how long-term that behaviour change is. I think what's really interesting, um, and I think where you are seeing behaviour change within virtual reality, is actually in those moments where we are bombarded with information, we have to make quick decisions, can virtual reality train us to deal with those situations, train us to know what to switch off and what to focus on? So, for example, virtual reality being used to train doctors. So, for example, doctors in war zones. Can you use virtual reality to help people get used to the fact they'll be doing something in a different, in a different environment with noise, with you know, visual stimulus and things? Um, I, I have heard that the virtual reality has been used to train staff store managers at Walmart now in the US to help them deal with Black Friday. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you run a store when you've got all the craziness uh, you know, around Black Friday and things? Um, we're, we're actually working on a project ourselves, looking at how VR can help get people more accustomed to cycling. One of the barriers to people cycling more is not that they are against cycling, don't want to do it, but often don't feel as comfortable, don't feel secure you know, riding around streets and things. So can we use virtual reality to get people used to riding around a different environment? So that's really sort of the conclusion of, of, of my, my wrap-up and my presentation today. I think in summary, what I would say is it's harder to change human behaviour than we think sometimes. And it, sometimes we think behaviours change when it's not really. We can all design a lovely path, but, you know, people will go off and take the shortcut if they want to do. Um, what we need to do, if we want to understand the impact that technology will have on the future, really look at the human needs. What human needs is that technology appealing to? Because that's really what's going to drive it. I think a great quote from earlier on was, if you want to know, know what the future is, see where people are having fun. And I think that's a great insight, you know, look at that human need. Um, but then second, you know, where technology potentially can help us is with the information overload that we're facing in the world. It's not yet developed in the way it could do, but I think that's one of the future things that we need to look out. For me, that's part of the new reality that I would want to keep an eye on. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions for Matt before he leaves the stage? No? 
Oh, yes, one in the middle. If we can get a mic. I'm Harry Emma, VC. Um, so I'm a big fan of kind of like the nudge model, all, all of those things, but kind of the big question would be about regulatory oversight and how far you can go with kind of behavioral science insights. Um, and so I was just kind of wondering how far do you think we can go, because on one end there's like kind of subliminal messaging where you're actually, it's pretty quite scary, kind of like trying to make people buy stuff, and at the same time there's kind of, you, you think nudging might be better where people know better, say with the cyber bullying example, like how, how do you see there being a division and like how that might develop? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it is a really important point. I mean, any time you're trying to influence someone's behaviour, you have to ask the question if you're doing the right thing. You know, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's necessarily changed with the kind of the increased interest in behavioural science. So if you're trying to influence someone, you have to ask, are you doing the right thing? Are you doing it in the right way? And regulation has a, has a point to play there. I believe that Richard Thaler, one of the key behavioural economists, whenever he does a book signing of nudge, he signs nudge for good, you know, because obviously trying to focus people on doing that. I think one thing we do have to understand is, this is what the behavioural science shows, is that um, people are influenced and nudged anyway. By every, we, don't, we don't live or operate in a neutral context. So often it's not just looking about what you can do to change someone's behaviour, but actually what is already happening that's influencing someone's behaviour. It's as important to understand the current context sometimes. Uh, but yeah, you know, um, like anything, I think regulation, and often behavioural science seems a way of you know, changing people's behaviour without regulation. Sometimes regulation is important. Any others from the floor? Yep, another one just down here. I, I just wanted to ask you for your view on the amount of news we're getting. Mm. So the continual sort of mostly negative news. What, what's your observation on our human response to that? Yeah, I mean, um, there was some research so recently about like, in, the impact of, um, I suppose, not, not just news, but kind of social media on kind of teenager, um, uh, not behaviour, but I suppose attitudes at the moment, and showing a big rise in anxiety, actually, um, amongst young people. I think that, that have, will have an impact. Like I say, we are not used to dealing with all this information. We're not used to having it at our fingertips or even kind of pushed towards it. Um, so I think there is, there is a danger. Like I say, our, our, just as with the, you know, the sweet, fatty foods, we haven't, caught, haven't moved as quickly as the environment in which we're operating has. So I think definitely you know, issues of um, anxiety and things. I mean, the challenge you have with news and, and things like that, it's, it's addictive. It's like anything. When you see the ping of a new story or a new development of a new story, you want to you get the next hit. You want to get the reward. It's not too different to, you know, Pokemon Go or other games where you're getting that hit. And I think that's the danger. How do we cope with news as a kind of hit like that? Fantastic. Last question, yeah. How do you th feel about the fact that people are spending more time online and curating their online uh, personalities and, and the sense that some might think they're moving away from interactions that are more human to behavioral uh, attributes that, that they feel a more fitting of how they want to be perceived as to how they are. Are we moving more towards a virtual world where everybody kind of feels more comfortable online than they do in a, in a sort of physical context? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that would almost take me back to my first points about is it the behaviour's changed, but has actually the fundament, has the fundamental human driver of that changed? And I think we've always, you know, as, as people, had this sense of identity that we want to express to the world, and often that that sense of who we are is a slightly idealised version that we want to present to the world. That impacts, you know, the clothes that we wear or the books that we show we're reading or things like that. You're trying to show a slightly different version of you, an idealised version of you to others. And undoubtedly, online allows you to do that even more. What that means, good or bad, I don't know, I have to say. I think, you know, it is, you can see why that is driving behaviour because it's an easier way of doing that fundamental human need. Whether that's good or bad, what impact it will have long term, I don't know. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks Thank for you. that. Thank you.